So the 2023 cycle is pretty much all the way done. The transfer portal is moving rapidly, and junior days are going to start right here on the Hill this Saturday and in two weeks from now as well. John Garcia, Sports Illustrated, going to join us here for Wednesday, Locked on Balls. You are Locked on Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome into it. This is Locked on Vols. I'm your host, Eric Kane. So glad that you liked it to spend some time with me here on the YouTube channel. You can always like and subscribe to this video, subscribe to the channel, or wherever you get your podcast. I'm the host here, Locked on Vols. Locked on Vols, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every single day. You can always find me on Twitter at underscore Kaner and at Locked on Vols. Uh, I said we're going to get into a little bit of uh, the Twitter Tuesday questions. I promise we're going to get to them at some point this week, but there's a lot going on. We're going to recap Tennessee's basketball game a little bit tomorrow with Josh Ward. Got some other interviews coming up for the rest of the week. We will get to those questions, I do promise you. And I've got some thoughts on Tennessee finishing sixth in the Associated Press poll uh, to end the season. I got a lot of thoughts on that. We'll get into that the rest of the week, but I want to talk a lot of recruiting here today with our guy, John Garcia. And of course, as always, that is brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. So without further ado, let's bring in the guy, the, the man, the myth, the legend, John Garcia. John, what's going on, man? Uh, doing well, Eric. Yeah, busy time for everybody. Uh, obviously, the season now officially in the books. Uh, but of course, we've been turning the page of recruiting for for several months at, at this point. So uh, happy to talk about it. Three peat on the way. That's behind you right now. Do you think there'll be a three peat for Georgia coming I, up next I year? Mean, I got a question mark on there. It, it really prisoner of the moment. Me says, my gosh. Um, they could be better next year because I, I think a lot of these key pieces are coming back defensively. They were incredibly young this year. Uh, they've got some wide receiver talent coming in, which is really the one, if you had to point out a weakness on the roster, it had been there the last couple of years. So I do think they have an opportunity to three P, but obviously incredibly hard. Uh, their schedule though, outside of uh, your audience's favorite team, pretty light in 23. So hard to imagine them, not at least in Atlanta, if not in the playoff next year, even though it's incredibly early to do any of that. So we'll see. They've got some some work to do ahead, but a lot of returning talent. And again, a, a schedule and a roster that that could be more favorable next year. Yeah, it's always it's always tough to say that a team from the SEC doesn't play anybody because, of course, you play an SEC schedule. But of course, I mean, that out of conference schedule, Tennessee included, it's it's not very it's not very tough next year. But man, Georgia's is it is it is really not tough. So, of course, we'll. We'll see what happens there. And, of course, it makes that November the – I don't even know what date it is. Early November date matchup uh, that all the more important. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's do talk a little Tennessee. Uh, big news uh, in terms of the transfer portal. Let's start there. Monday earlier this week was a haul for Tennessee. Not one, not two, but three uh, incoming commits from the transfer portal. Oregon wide receiver Dante Thornton, Arizona State defensive lineman Omar Norman Lott, and Miami offensive tackle John Campbell. Let's start there. I know you're familiar with John Campbell. Tell us what Tennessee's getting in that offensive tackle that started, correct me if I'm wrong, every single game this year at left tackle. Yeah, started every game this year at left tackle. Earlier in his career, played a lot of right tackle, which is really kind of where we thought he would end up just tracking him out of high school. But the need at Miami because of some injuries and other situations through their coaching change, he was kind of thrust out there at left tackle. Wasn't always great, but Tennessee doesn't need that. I think he's a right tackle candidate there uh, in Knoxville. Uh, he's got a ton of experience, ex extremely long. He was a lot leaner coming out of high school, but has really filled out uh, as an upperclassman uh, down there at the U. And, and I think when you talk about grad transfers, we – it's easy to talk quarterbacks and, and receivers and kind of the splashier skill position players. But if you look at the more tangible success stories, there are droves of offensive linemen who were average to, to above average that ended up being all conference level or borderline all conference level when they got that fresh start. So I do think this is a potential situation for John Campbell. He's already more comfortable as a pass protector than as a run blocker. So naturally you think of Tennessee's scheme and there's a really strong fit here. And this was a big win. The moment he hit the portal, Eric, everybody on my timeline and just my sources back home in Florida were like, he's going to stay in state. It's just a matter of, of where, right? So Florida versus yeah. Florida State, both needy on the offensive line. Yet and still, Tennessee comes in and sells something 
current. And I think that's really a good example of UT riding this momentum from the 22 season. Campbell was, again, pretty much considered a lock elsewhere but before he uh, got to check out Knoxville. So kudos to that entire staff, really. Big for Tennessee, too, because he wrapped up his official visit with Tennessee Friday morning, then went to Florida, spent all weekend in Florida, but committed to Tennessee Monday night. Um, you know, we'll see. Uh, there, there's opportunity there. Tennessee split the left tackle position between two players this year. Lo you're losing Darnell Wright, uh, which is a massive loss. But the fact that he has versatility, can play on the right side, I think that's going to help. And I think Tennessee wants him to come in and play, so we'll have to track that. Uh, the splashiest get from the transfer portal so far for Tennessee, which now has seven commits from the transfer portal, probably wide receiver Dante Thornton, a guy that's going to have multiple years of eligibility remaining. Real quick, John Campbell. Um, I've seen some places where he says he has two seasons of eligibility. This will be his sixth season. Do you have any clarity on that? He didn't play a ton, I believe, as uh, a twenty in the 2020 COVID season, but he also got injured during that season. So there's a combination COVID and red shirt possibility in that regard. So I think it is up to two uh, just based off of that, but I don't know that for sure. But look, the NCAA has been very lenient with all of this stuff. So, you know, you got him for 23 TBD for 24, but if he does, you know, if he does what we think he can do and takes that next step, it might not matter in the end. I'll be glad when the whole COVID year of eligibility is over with. It's so oh, hard to keep two track more of. Years, two more years. Back, <laughs> back to Dante Thornton, a guy that's uh, you know seen some action the, uh, the, the the last two seasons, played in four games in 2021. So he'll actually have three years of eligibility remaining. Um, saw his pass targets and all that type of stuff go up. He is long. I saw him on Sunday. He is every bit of six foot four, six foot five, 200 pounds, explosive. Says that he can play slot and outside. He screams outside receiver in the system for me. What do you like about Dante Thornton and Morgan? Well, when you think of what Tennessee does so well, it's taking these vertical shots with guys who can just beat you one on one. And Dante Thornton's mark as a six foot four, six foot five guy, as you mentioned, is really his linear speed. So, in terms of the fit, you got to love what that potential could look like. Uh, Oregon changed a ton this year uh, under Kenny Dillingham as OC. Of course, they'll change again because he has now departed, but it was a lot more lateral stuff uh, as opposed to just streaking down the field. But his bread and butter is, is still kind of what we thought of Jalen Hyatt before the 22 season. Obviously, he showed a whole lot more this past year, but the bread and butter there was, was that vertical ability to, to stretch the defense. Dante has that in spades. I, I do think there's work to be done uh, from the underneath perspective and rounding out his game, but a big physical body uh, who can really accelerate and explode in that lower half, you've got the mold to create a little bit of what you want. But like you said, even though he, he says he's a slot, I think this is a no-brainer outside wide receiver uh, who at a minimum is going to challenge the depth of the secondary. But if he puts it all together and he's got multiple years to do it, he could be one of the steals of this transfer portal class because the physical profile is about as good as it gets at the wide receiver position. Even if he somehow puts on a bunch of weight and you got to flex him to, to some kind of tight end role, it would still work out. He, he's a bit of a freak of nature athletically. It's just got to come all together. And oftentimes a fresh start uh, can, can really accelerate that process. And obviously at the receiver position, there's a lot of comfort and stability with what Tennessee's doing. And then last up from a Monday, actually, he was the the, the middle part of this package, but uh, uh, Omar Norman Lott, defensive lineman, more of an interior guy, a three technique, a shade. He actually entered the transfer portal this time last year. Rodney Garner went after him then, ended up staying at a uh, ASU. Uh, goes back in the transfer portal. Rodney Garner went right back after him again. Um, I was impressed when I spoke with him after his visit to Tennessee. Uh, a guy that just loves putting in the work and trying to add to what Tennessee is building defensively uh, here in Knoxville. Yeah, we, we were hearing about him in the portal last year, and when I that's when I first came across him. And he kind of admitted like he was incredibly raw coming out of high school. So this is one who has developed within getting Power Five reps, and, and that's impressive in and of itself, and I think points to his athleticism and maybe the ceiling that he brings. But over the last year, I think his technique has improved. He's played with a lower pad level, and he's been incredibly disruptive. So I do think this could be potentially a, a two-way guy in the sense that he can push the pocket and, and rush the passer, but also occupy those gaps and allow these second-level players that, that Tennessee's bringing in to be a little bit more free as they come downhill or move laterally. So I think this is an intriguing get. Obviously, as you mentioned, if Rodney Garner wants you, you're probably pretty good anyway. If he wants you after he misses you, you're definitely – you definitely got something that, that he thinks he can unlock, and obviously his history says – 
he's more likely to do it than not. So really like this get. Um, you got to work the trenches and re reshape them uh, when you move forward. And then obviously Tennessee's looking to do that uh, by any means necessary. Love the high school hall, but now you bring an experience on top of it. Uh, that's really the perfect mix. We'll hit the high school ranks here in just a moment more with John Garcia of SI and, of course, the Locked On Podcast Network. But first, a message from our friends over at BetOnline.net, your number one source for all your sports betting information, news, stats, and uh, all the things you need to, to make an educated uh, you know, little, little wager over at BetOnline.net. All the latest odds, trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bowl season, basketball, the World Cup, They've got it all at betonline.net. If you love sports podcasts like the one you're listening to and watching right now, they've got it over there as well, but you got to watch this one first. That's the caveat. Always the fastest and easiest way to get all your sports betting information. Hey, that line for the national championship the other night, that was 13 in favor of Georgia. If you took Georgia, obviously you came out on top. If you took the over and whatever the total was, obviously you came out on top. I mean, what just an atrocious national championship game, but still a lot of you guys made some money over at betonline.net and you continue to do that throughout the college basketball season and the NFL playoffs. Bet online, it is where the game starts. We'll go back into your Wednesday edition of Locked On Vols. Got our guy John Garcia on to talk a little recruiting, brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. John, we talked transfer portal in segment 1. Let's hit up some highlights of uh, you know, G- Tennessee has one of two junior days coming up here in a couple days on Saturday. The second one is going to be on the 28th. Um, but uh, a really nice in-state class for the University of Tennessee already. A couple of in-state, and you got Carson Gentle and Caleb Beasley, defensive end, and uh, the, the the defensive back. A lot of other guys like, um, you know, uh, Boo Carter, potentially. We'll see what Tennessee wants to do there. But it's a really nice in-state class for the University of Tennessee when you're looking at the class of 2024. A lot of skill guys, right? And I think that's uh, that's pretty interesting. You know, I think it's easy to uh, just start pegging guys. Hey, this guy is more likely to, to stay in SEC country. This guy might not. Uh, and some of the uncommitted ones are are really kind of funky with with the schools that they're considering. You mentioned Boo Carter. I think Tennessee is the only SEC school in the mix for him. I mean, so this is a, a fascinating development. I think another sign of of the times, right? I mean, it, it's it's one thing to expect top level in-state recruits to stay home but it's not as easy maybe as it used to be uh and i think carter's a great example of that but yeah good start to the 24 cycle already for tennessee good end to the 23 cycle in state of course with arian carter and company uh joining uh, late in the game so yeah junior days are big and i think they're they're maybe more important than they've ever been on two fronts one eric because these decisions are coming faster right i think if you're an elite 2024 guy, and look, Tennessee is recruiting in that ballpark now uh, pretty much exclusively, you're going to start to think about making a decision, or at least you have the opportunity to do so. So naturally, getting back to one of these campuses is always going to be advantageous. And these junior days are getting more creative in terms of the mm-hmm. activities and just the things that go down, whether it's a basketball game or any other um, spring activity that you can throw into it it makes it uh, all the more attractive uh, for these prospects. So important to get them on campus because you just never know how soon these decisions could come. So some have set dates. Some are going to just pop on these junior days. It happens every single year. So important to accumulate as much talent uh, as possible. And then secondly, for these coaching staffs, December was nuts. I know we'll talk about that later, but the, the late regular season window to go out and evaluate is so hectic now that you've got to filter it to 23. So this is a good opportunity for Tennessee to get eyeballs on these recruits and start to really think, hey, do you fit from a physical perspective? Or personality-wise, do you fit in that regard? I mean, that's kind of one of the lesser talked about uh, items when it comes to recruiting because we could talk about these kids and their top groups, but really these schools are dictating a a lot of that on their end. So uh, I think junior days can serve both fronts uh, simultaneously. It'll be a big one, too, because Tennessee basketball is hosting Kentucky, so a lot of those guys will go to that game. That's always – you schedule those around and try to go to a big uh, SEC matchup on a Saturday inside Thompson Bowling Arena. Marcus Gorey, Bradley Central, he's another big one in state. Amari Jefferson, who's actually committed to uh, Tony Vitello's baseball team. Uh, Tennessee likes him a lot from Baylor School. But I think when you discuss – of course, you got Caleb Be- Beasley mm-hmm. and Carson Gentle already in the boat. But I think when you discuss the in-state class of uh, for Tennessee – I mean, the conversation's got to start with Edwin Spillman. Um, Brother Nate Spillman, a part of the 23 signing class. Tennessee did a good job there. Uh, Very close. Also, some Academy teammates of Caleb Beasley, who's already a commit. 
I just feel like this is a matter of when, not if. Is it going to be soon? Is it going to be earlier? Are they going to help use him to build this class? Or is he going to want to do his due diligence and you know go on some visits over the summer? Well, he's got no shortage of options, right? So that's yeah. really step one in that regard. Um, if he's confirmed on one or both of these junior days, I'd probably start to really think about something sooner rather than later pro Tennessee with, with all of those connections. Uh, but yeah, he's got no shortage of options. I mean, a kid who's physically so impressive, uh, ready to go right now at the collegiate level as a, it's a modern three down type linebacker. Uh, he could be the best prospect in the state, you know, for, yeah. for this, this upcoming year as well. So again, a lot of, a lot of back seven skill position players are coming up in Tennessee and you know, there's always some beef alongside it. So, you know, the, the state I think has always held its own, but that profile seems like it's rising over the last couple of cycles in particular. Two more guys when you look out of state that I want to touch on here with you. Um, I think the conversation when you when you go out of state is always starting with Ron Wingo. He's a talented wide receiver. I saw Tennessee play a couple of different times. It was actually in-house in Tennessee, played Pittsburgh early in the season as well. And then Cam Pringle, he put out his top six, I believe, earlier this week. Tennessee was a part of that. I think Tennessee's got some ground to make up, but he's been on campus a couple of times. He likes Glenn Ellerby. I think those are two out-of-state guys that Tennessee really, really likes. Yeah, Wingo, I mean, you, you could argue he's the top receiver in, in the entire country for next year. And he's a St. Louis kid, which is always so intriguing, right? I like to look at geography when I look at recruiting and, and who's pulling what type of talent. St. Louis has been kind of open season for a very long time. I don't know if any one school has like commanded that Metro. And when you've got a national recruit in St. Louis, it gets all the more competitive. But look, we talked about it with, with Dante Thornton earlier. When you're a wide receiver considering – Tennessee, um, it, it just has a different feel now than it did 18 or even 24 months ago. So I, I think you increase the expectation level when Tennessee is involved, especially when that profile is only rising and a guy like Ryan Wingo appears like he's in no rush to come off the board. So that offer list is crazy. Everybody wants him. But as he is in no rush, that profile will only rise both perceptionally with Tennessee and with Coach Pope, who I think has really done a great job of not only identifying talent, but landing talent both in high school and the portal. Tennessee's historically a program that gets after it early in, in the next and preceding cycles. Uh, so I think they were in it pretty early with Wingo, even though he's become this national recruit. Uh, and like you said, a couple of visits to Knoxville for games already in the books. So those boxes are checked as well. So you have to imagine – UT stays in the mix for Wingo, I would imagine, all the way through, especially with him not being in any rush. And then with Pringle, it's kind of the opposite, right? Uh, commitment date at the end of the month, uh, top six is is littered with great programs. But Tennessee's kind of climbing in that race. So it kind of looks like one of those, can you climb fast enough to win it? Or how does this look after the verbal commitment goes down? Because this is another player that is arguably – top at his position nationally for that 24 cycle, even though it's incredibly early. So yeah, that's another measuring stick battle in my opinion with, with Tennessee. Um, a lot of, a lot of South Carolina natives have come up recently with UT recruiting. So I think that'll be fascinating to see another one play out. Of course, the Gamecocks feel good. Clemson's in the mix there, but a lot of other schools are heavy uh, for Cam Pringle as well. So that one will be fascinating both when he decides and then kind of how it looks after that point, in my opinion. That's one that I could see changing hands a couple times. In that transition period to where, sure, there might be a guy that signed in the February signing period, but, you know, a guy that pops up a little late, but there's nobody on the horizon right now for Tennessee. Um, 23 is pretty much done, um, and you're, you're finishing up this window, the transfer portal, which Tennessee's done a good job in that regard. Mm -hmm. And now all attention on the 2024 class with those junior days and trying to build the foundation of your class. That way you can really go to work over the summer. Some of these guys we're talking about, the Ron Wingos, Cam Pringles we just mentioned, and you know the Evelyn Spillmans and the Gorys and um, you know Beasleys and Gentles and Boo Carters, all those guys, very important for Tennessee in the class of 2024. What about recruiting overall? You know, John, you just mentioned a moment ago about how it's so hectic in the month of December. SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey came out and pretty much said that needs to change. I'm going to get John's thoughts essentially on what Sankey said and how this could affect the recruiting calendar moving forward when we come next, when we come back right here on Locked on Balls. Rolling right along here on your Wednesday edition of Locked on Balls. I'm your host, Eric Kane. We got John Garcia our recruiting insider for the Locked On Podcast Network, joining us right now. And, of course, it is brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. 
John, so Greg Sankey in an interview with The Athletic earlier this week uh, when he got to town for the national championship, he was speaking about how the recruiting calendar needs to change. He said, hey, we're crushing coaches in December. We're going out and adding playoff games in December. We've got to change the early signing period. We've created more pressure for young people. Um, there was a notion that we needed these long windows to alleviate pressure. I think we created pressure for young people. We're going to start losing coaches to early retirements or to the NFL. I couldn't agree more. I think December is absolutely nuts. I think it's way too much on coaches. I mean, honestly, and I've said this before, I, I mean, I, I think coaches deserve every penny they make because they've got to deal with so much stuff. December is not what it used to be. What do you think about that? The potential of early signing period being pushed to January. Um, I think that's the direction it would go in. And, and this could be as early as potentially next offseason as far as Gray Sankey is concerned. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, he's right. I mean, th there's no doubt that December has become the tipping point in a lot of ways for college coaches. And the reason why some interesting young NFL coaches want to stay put, they, they don't want to jump back into college ball I know several personally that are like, look, man, I, until recruiting changes, I'm not jumping back down. And that's before you get into NIL and all the other craziness going on. Really, it's the overlap. That's the issue. The portal's open. There's bowl prep and then early signing day while the portal's open. And oh, by the way, the carousel is spinning like crazy yep. from, from Thanksgiving on. So it really is hard for these schools, even with SEC-like resources, to put it all together, uh, and, and it's why you see so much fluidity both with the coaching staffs and with the players, both in, in the portal and in, in traditional high school recruiting. There's an urgency there that is maybe unnecessary all at one point. So January would make sense. I mean, the carousel is all but, but done at this point uh, with college. The season is now done. The portal it seemingly has some clarity in terms of who's left with that window wrapping up in, in just about a week. So I do think this would make sense, but it's hard, right? When we know change is coming, it's not like the NCAA is incredibly swift with all of these things. Um, and on top of that, everybody's pushed in the last decade to move these high school recruits towards early graduation. So you do have a majority of kids finishing up high school in December before enrolling in January. So we get that overlap to where do they even need to sign a letter of intent if they can just enroll in the month of January. So I think there is some some speed bumps ahead, even if January is the transition point. But the foundational issue makes a ton of sense. There's too much overlap. I mean, some teams were playing bowl games on National Signing Day. I mean, that's yeah. that doesn't even compute in my brain uh, comfortably. So, yeah, just imagine the logistical issues for, for those type of programs. So, yeah, I think that there has to be some type of change, but it's it's got to fit in a window that makes sense. And right now that, uh, what is it, the third Wednesday in December is just a little bit too crazy. There's too much going on with the current portal window and carousel issues in place. And remember, the carousel really spins in November and closer to Thanksgiving because of the early signing period in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Coaches or schools want their coaches in place in order to at least have a week or a couple days before that early signing period hits and most of the class is, is either in or out. So the, the the overlap is created by the early signing period in large part. So moving that, I think, would be a logical first step. Uh, but I agree, it's it's total chaos in December, for lack of a better term. And just because maybe the, the head coaching carousel might be done spinning – um, you know, towards you know, the early signing period or whatever. I mean, you still got to find assistants and offensive coordinators and recruiting coordinators and strength and conditioning staff. coaches. And yeah. uh, again, the, the a lot of these players that are being recruited by these position coaches are on the move. It, it's just a mess. And I agree with you. I think I think the January window would make a whole lot of sense. Let me talk, let me talk about another window, which I don't think would happen. But from a recruiting calendar standpoint. August 1st makes so much sense, right? That's when it goes, uh, you know, essentially it opens back up there towards the end of July. It goes dead again. They get ready for their high school season. You have all the official visits in, in the month of June. You know, there's that wave. And then a lot of people come off the board sometime in July with verbal commits. August the 1st would make sense as well. However, there is so much red tape and so much problems with that as well. Because, again, for reasons we've already mentioned, the coaching carousel. And then, obviously, a guy like Arian Carter, who Tennessee got in its class, he didn't get Power 5 offers 
until week three of his high school football season. Right. He would be playing running back at Memphis if he signed at August the 1st, if that was the case there. So I don't think that's perfect, but that could also be another way you could go about this. Yeah, and that would be that would truly feel like an early signing window, yeah. right? Because right now it just feels like uh, it's the buildup uh, to, to the end of the cycle. I think a true sense of early – would make sense for August 1st. It wouldn't be the majority of recruits like we see in December. I think it'd be a much smaller portion, and it would give some clarity to either the programs or prospects that are extremely comfortable with where they stand. And that would allow, um, let's say, a third or a fourth of the class to come off the board, your in-state guys, the ones that you feel most comfortable about taking, and allow you to allocate more resources towards those that might still be available and give you some some freedom to move throughout the portal and with those Arian Carter like senior risers simultaneously. So that could make some sense from the program's perspective, but yeah, from the kids' perspective, do you envision my first thought was how many kids ask out of that that letter of intent if and when a coaching change happens or if their recruiting profile does increase or decrease? Uh, after that letter of intent is signed, do programs want to push out a kid or two uh, in that process? So every domino here creates more issues, but the the ground floor level situation is like, look, December is crazy. It, it can't be really at any point in December, in, in my opinion. So moving it forward and allowing it to be a smaller deal would make some sense and moving it towards January to where it's before these early enrollees make that official. I think that would make some sense as well, although it would coincide with some other open windows that that might make it a bit funky. So um, it's tough. It's tough to figure out, but obviously movement is needed. And I think that's the core idea that needs to be presented as soon as possible. So there has been six early signing periods. Uh, I keep track of this by Tennessee's head coach, Jeremy Pruitt comes in. He had about a week, and then that was the first year of it. So 2018, 19, 21, 2, and now 23. Yep. Um, movement is needed. But last thing for you, when is that going to happen? Is it going to happen? Kind of what's your prediction on what this might look like, let's say, let's say four years from now? Oh, it'll move. It'll move for sure. Uh, I think the portal windows will, will move as well. Uh, I think there'll be more portal windows. Uh, it have to be a little bit more narrow. I mean, there's kids still jumping in the portal as we record uh, yeah. that are going to come off the board, you know, by, by the 18th when that window closes. So I, I think you've got to kind of structure it somehow, Eric, to where it's like one thing at a time. Let us handle <laughs> one thing at a time. So maybe it's the early signing period in August. Uh, the portal window opens after bowl season, before spring ball or that spring semester gets going. So a very small, maybe two week window as opposed to a 45 day window, which seems rather large uh, for, for prospects making decisions in most cases really quickly. Right. Take a couple visits, come off the board and that's it. And in some cases, you already know prospect X is making a move before he hits the portal. So I, I do think moving multiple windows would make the most sense, but I, I don't envision it staying the same, e even in the next two years, much less uh, double that. John Garcia, our Locked On Recruiting Insider, joining us here on Locked On Balls. Thanks to our friends over at LinkedIn Job. Uh, John, what, what's coming up uh, on, on your side for SI here? It's a really, really busy time. Yeah, a lot of finality in this 23 class, as you mentioned at the top of the show, and, and we're following suit. The final SI-99 rankings for this class will drop uh, at some point this week. Excited about that. There's a lot of movement, as there always is. Tennessee fans, I think you, you'll, you'll definitely want to check that one out. A couple new Vols will appear uh, on that list. Uh, so Tennessee's great class will have a little bit more shine on it when that SI-99 drops this week. So we're looking forward to it. And always follow John on Twitter as well at John Garcia underscore junior. John, thanks so much, man. Anytime. Always a pleasure catching up with John Garcia as he brings us some truth in the world of recruiting. Um, always a good conversation, not just recruiting, but the transfer portal as well, uh, the recruiting calendar, all that good stuff. John is the man for that. Hey, we got a whole lot coming up uh, the rest of this week on the show. We'll talk Tennessee hoops. We'll catch up with Josh Ward. Uh, we'll answer your questions for Twitter Tuesday that now looks like it's going to be on a Thursday. I promise you still got them. Send them in. We'll, we'll have a mailbag at some point this week. All that and more. That's what you have to stay tuned for the rest of this week right here on Lockdown Balls. Can't thank you enough for making it your first listen each and every day. Same time, same place. Let's do it again tomorrow. This is Lockdown Balls. Balls.